بودكاست Hello everyone, where Hadr Takhaf is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Yes. Good to see you. <laughs> I'd stand up, but I'm so bad. I'm like squashed. So yeah, it's good to see you. Your hair looks different. I know. I'm. Uh... It looks good. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you come now, you can decide later. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, um, my Tladzumala Fitnain Rahiku Bil Inglisi or Shahs Rahikabil Arabi. Two people will be speaking in English, one person in Arabic. So if anybody needs uh, headphones, please get them now. Okay. My name is Maha Yahya. I'm a senior associate at the Carnegie Middle East Center. Uh, I'll be moderating this panel. Each of the speakers will be speaking for 15 minutes, and then we will be opening up to discussions. I'm going to start with a few comments on the panel itself, and I will also speak in English, given that there's a predominance. Uh, <laughs> um, it's interesting that this panel today has on it uh, two case studies. We're looking at the case of Tunisia, and then we're looking at the case of Syria, uh, basically the two countries that have garnered the most attention from the world uh, in the past five years. One for its um, what is being billed as its successful democratic transition, or at least political transition, and the other for it for a total meltdown, unfortunately. Um, so while one, uh, you know, the, uh, global powers are scrambling to look at ways in which to support the Tunisian transition, we have at least seven country, 70 countries that are currently involved and in, actively involved in the conflict in Syria uh, in one way or the other. Um, but what is very clear about both situations, whether we're looking at Tunis or whether we're looking at Syria, is that, that there is a considerable crisis of legitimacy in the two polar opposites of the Arab uprisings in terms of results, is that we're looking at a crisis of legitimacy uh, in, across the region. And this crisis is not simply a crisis of political legitimacy, but it's also of societal leg legitimacy. Uh, and it's one where the relationship of Tate and societies is being uh, reconsidered and refabricated as we speak. Um, perhaps uh, in the Tunisian case study or in the Tunisian case, what has been to some extent its saving grace uh, is the attempt by the political leadership uh, to uh, create a consensus-based uh, political process. And I know that Hafez will be speaking uh, extensively about this consensus-based political process and its implications on where we are in Tunis today. However, as we've seen in Kasrin over the past few days, the, the, uh, the demonstrations and the protests, 
uh, this transition is still quite uh, fragile, uh, in part, I believe, because the uh, the question of who has the authority to re represent whom, uh, and because of the inability until now to address the socioeconomic equities or socioeconomic conditions in the country uh, persist. For many Tunisians, things have gotten much, much worse uh, than they were uh, at the beginning of the uprising in 2010, December 2010. And I'm sure we'll get into a lot more discussion uh, on this. On the other end of the spectrum, Syria, obviously, the, uh, the total meltdown is in large part uh, the brutal response of the regime to a uh, civil uprising. Uh, and it's, uh, I mean, what we're seeing today is obviously a disintegration of, of uh, a state system. We're seeing brutal uh, population transfers, barrel bombs, uh, the emergence of non-state actors, I mean, forms of organization and alternate forms that are claiming alternate forms of legitimacy at very different levels in Syria. Um, with these sort of just opening remarks, and I know we'll be hearing <coughs> a bit more about this, both from Wendy, who will be talking about uh, the uh, what taking to the street has meant to people and um, the what it has done to people's psyche, which is, I, th I believe, a dimension that uh, many of those who have very been very quick to pass judgment on the Arab uprisings and doom them to failure often forget. Uh, and I think what we're seeing across the region, whether it's in Syria, despite the horrific conditions, or whether it is in, in Tunis, uh, is the persistence uh, and the reinforcement of um, the impact of the uprisings on the human psyche. Uh, and Linda also will be talking a bit about what the state in Syria has been trying to do in terms of mitigating, at least on the social level, uh, some of the impact of the conflict. With these comments, uh, I will begin with the order of the speakers. I believe it is Hafiz first. Um, let me introduce Hafiz, please. Um, he's a professor of secondary education in Rabat. He has authored several published studies and holds a higher diploma from Dar al-Hadith in Rabat. He also holds a national uh, doctorate on the subject of Islamic mysticism and Islamic studies in the West. As I mentioned, he will be talking about the process of national consensus building and the, effect, the impact it had uh, in Tunisia versus Egypt. Hafiz al-Kalam Thank you. مساء الخير الموضوع الذي سأتحدث عنه هو سجال الهوية وأثره على عسر الانتقال الديمقراطي في المرحلة الانتقالية حالة مصر وتونس دراسة مقارنة إذا كان الحراك العربي قد فاجأ أغلب الدارسين وعلماء السياسة والاجتماع نظرا لسرعة بثاقه وتوهجه وكذا قوة تدفقه وتمدده ثم عمق شعاراته ومطالبه فإن مآلات هذا الحراك بعد مرور خمس سنوات على انطلاقه تبقى هي الأخرى محيرة بالنظر إلى تعددها واختلافها ولعل الأسباب التي أدت إلى اختلاف مآلات الحراك متعددة لكن هذه الورقة ستعنى بشكل خاص بدراسة مشكلة بعينها ألا وهي مدى تأثير التوافق الوطني أو غيابه على نجاح المرحلة الانتقالية أو فشلها من خلال التركيز على قضايا سجال الهوية العلماني الإسلامي عن طريق المقارنة بين تجربتين مختلفتين شهدت إحداهما فراجا نسبيا نحو الاستقرار والتحول الديمقراطي وهي تجربة تونسية بينما عرفت التجربة الأخرى انتكاسا مريرا نحو الاستبداد وهي التجربة المصرية ومبعث التركيز على هذا المتغير دون غيره من هذه في هذه الدراسة مرده إلى أسباب منها أولا كون العوامل التي أسهمت في اختلاف مآلات تجارب العربية منها الظاهر ومنها الكامن ولعل عناية الباحثين قد انصرفت على غير المعتاد إلى صبر أغوار العوامل الكامنة وإبرازها في حين ظلت العوامل الظاهرة حبيسة الظل ومنها حالة الاستقطاب على أساس الهوية ثانيا أهمية هذا المتغير تكمن في الرفع من مستوى الأداء والمشاركة السياسية ناهيك عن إثراء تجربة الانتقال الديمقراطي أو إفقارها وعليه 
فالفرض الاساس لهذه الورقه هي انه كلما برزت السجل السجل عفوا السجالات حول الهويه وطفت الاستقطابات المذهبيه على السطح في المراحل الانتقاليه نحو الحكم الديمقراطي كلما افضت الى الاخفاق في تحقيق الوفاق الوطني المفضي بدوره الى عسر التحول الديمقراطي وفي المقابل كلما خفتت حدة هذه السجالات وخاب أوارها كلما كان الوفاق الوطني أقرب والتحول الديمقراطي أيسر ولبحث هذه القضايا اخترت العمل على دراسة وتحليل أنموذج الاستقطاب العلماني الإسلامي في بلدان الحراك العربي من خلال حالتين مختلفتين في المآل هما الحالة التونسية والحالة المصرية والسؤال المركزي لهذه الدراسة هو كيف أثر استعار حدة الاستقطاب الهويات أو خفوته على اختلاف مآلات الحالتين موضوع الدراسة في البداية لابد من تحديد المفاهيم الأساسية في هذه الدراسة وأرى أنهما اثنتان أولا المرحلة الانتقالية ثم الهوية مفهوم الهوية فبالنسبة للمرحلة الانتقالية يمكن تعريفه على الشكل التالي مرحلة التحول والانتقال من نظم ذات طابعة سلطاوية أو شبه سلطاوية إلى نظم ديمقراطية وهي عملية شديدة التعقيد تشير إلى عملية التحول في الأبنية والأهداف والعمليات التي تؤثر على توزيع وممارسة السلطة السياسية وعليه فإن هذه المرحلة ترتبط بجملة من الخصائص والسمات التي ينبغي الوعي بها واستحضارها إبان الانتقال الديمقراطي وأرى أن أمهات هذه الخصائص تقوم على ثلاثة أقطاب كبرى أهم هذه الأقطاب الذي لا يمكن التنازل عنه أو التفريط فيه هو تحقيق الوحدة الوطنية من خلال التوافق على آليات إدارة المرحلة مرحلة التحول نحو الديمقراطية والتأسيس لمقومة الدولة الوطنية المنشودة ومن ضرورات بناء التوافقات الكبرى في المراحل الانتقالية إضافة إلى ما سبق ذكره والذي أعتبره بمثابة القطب الثاني الذي تدور في فلكه الخصائص المميزة لهذه المرحلة هو رفع كافة المخاوف المحيطة بسيطرة جهة ما على أجهزة الدولة وسياغة مقوماتها على أسس مذهبية ضيقة وثالث أقطاب المعادلة الانتقالية هي الإيمان بعمق التغيير الذي يجب أن تحدثه المرحلة الانتقالية في عقليات التفكير والسلوك الاجتماعي للناس وليس مجرد التركيز على الحلول السياسية بالنسبة لمفهوم الهوية سيتجه عملية التحليل بالأساس إلى التركيز على الأبعاد والدلالات الاجتماعية للمفهوم فإذا كانت الهوية تشير إلى شعور شخص ما بما هو وما هي الأشياء الأكثر أهمية بالنسبة إليه فإنها من وجهة نظر اجتماعية تحمل على مضمون محدد والمتمثل في تصورنا حول من نحن ومن الآخرون وكذلك تصور الآخرين حول أنفسهم وحول الآخرين وبذلك فإنها تتشكل من مختلف أدوات وأشكال التعبير التي تربط بين أعضاء الجماعة وحول تصوراتهم المشتركة للإنسان والعالم والمجتمع ونظر لتعدد المؤثرات الاجتماعية والعوامل الخارجية المؤثرة في خلق الهويات وامتدادها فإن ذلك ما ضنة تشظي الهوية وبروز هويات متنافرة لدى المجتمع الواحد الشيء الذي يفضي حتما إلى صراعات شديدة على أسس إيديولوجية بحيث تحاول جهة الأقوى فرض سيطرتها وهو ما لا تستطيع عادة الوصول إليه بفعل المقاومة الشرسة من طرف الإيديولوجيات المنافسة وهذا ما يقودنا إلى توصيف حالة الاحتراب على أسس هوياتية في دول الحراك العربي بالهويات المتعارضة ولا تجد أبرز سماتها بالإضافة إلى اختلاف أصولها الحضارية واستمداداتها الثقافية في حالة التنافي الحادة فيما بينها والتي لا تقي أي أرضية مشتركة للعمل الوطني الواحد المفترض خصوصا في مراحل الانتقال الديمقراطي فالراصد للاستقطاب عقب الربيع العربي يجده تمثل أساسا في الصراع بين تيارين كبيرين هما التيار الإسلامي بتعبيراته المختلفة والتيار العلماني بتنوعاته المتباينة وهو استقطاب ثنائي اختصر مختلف التعبيرات الدينية والاجتماعية في كتلتين عظيمتين تعبر كل واحدة منهما عن تبني عناصر فكرية وحضارية متناقضة لهذا يمكن اعتبار أساس هذا الاستقطاب هو قضايا الهوية بالدرجة الأولى خصوصا المتعلقة بعلاقات الدين بالسياسة وإدارة الشأن العام ونظر لتعدد القضايا التفصيلية التي تم بخصوصها الاستقطاب بين الطيارين المذكورين فإن القضايا الأساسية التي سأركز عليها في المقارنة بين التجربتين المصرية والتونسية هما مسألة الدعوة إلى تطبيق الشريعة والحريات الفردية باعتبارهما مكونين أساسيين من مكونات الهوية والخصوصية وكذلك باعتبارهما أكثر القضايا المثيرة للخلاف
فاذا من خلال تتبع الحالتين معا يمكننا ان نلاحظ انه سريعا ما طفت على السطح نذر الانقسام السياسي في مصر في المرحله الانتقاليه بسبب الاستفتاء على التعديلات الدستوريه يوم 19 مارس 2011 وكذلك برزت مشكله الاستقطاب فيما عرف بجمعة وحدة الصف يوم 29 يوليو 2011 حيث هيمنت الشعارات الإسلامية والدعوة إلى تطبيق الشريعة مما أدى بالعديد من القوى السياسية المناوئة الإنسحاب وقد زادت حدة هذه الاستقطابات بعد الانتخابات التشريعية وتشكيل اللجنة التأسيسية لصياغة الدستور التي رأى العلمانيون أنها لا تمثل الجميع الشيء الذي أدى إلى ظهور عدة وثائق موجهة للمبادئ الدستورية والتي كان بعضها مرجعا للجميع وعلى رأسها وثيقة الأزهر بشأن مستقبل مصر ورغم معارضة القوة الثورية جميعا لوثيقة السلم فإن الاختلاف سيظل على أشده بخصوص اللجنة التأسيسية وصياغة الدستور وصولا إلى انفجار الأوضاع السياسية عقب الإعلان الدستوري الشهير يوم 21 نوفمبر 2012 وقد كان السبب الرئيس في كل هذه الاختلافات والاستقطاب والاستقطابات هو صياغة الدستور الذي سيسمح بتحديد طبيعة الدولة والنظام الحاكل وشكل الحريات في المستقبل الشيء الذي أعطى لهذه المناكفات بعدا هوياتيا تلخص في الصراع على المادة الثانية من الدستور والطريقة التي ينبغي التعامل معها أما بخصوص التجربة التونسية فقد اتخذت القضية شكلا مختلفا إذ بعد انتخابات المجلس الوطني التأسيسي مباشرة قرر فرقاء الجماعة الوطنية تشكيل حكومة ترويكا وهو ما كان له انعكاس كبير على وحدة الصف الوطني وضمور عملية الاستقطاب لكن الأمر لن يظل على هذه الحال استشهد البلاد انقساما حدا بعد اغتيال كل من شكري بالعيد ومحمد برهمي لكن حكمة التونسيين كانت أكبر من هذه الانقسامات السياسية بحيث عمل الرباعي على قيادة حوار وطني صعب خلص إلى حياكة توافق توافقات حقيقية أنقذت تحول الديمقراطي مما يجعلنا نميل إلى اعتبار الاستقطاب التونسي استقطابا سياسيا بالدرجة الأولى لعبت فيه مسألة الهوية دورا ثانويا نظرا لضيق الوقت ف يعني المؤشرات المتعلقه بالاستقطاب المتعلق بتطبيق الشريعه والمتعلق بحريه الفرديه يعني مؤشرات كثيره جدا والتي يمكن استنتاجها من خلال البيانات والمواقف السياسيه لجميع الاطراف فلهذا سامر مباشره الى الملاحظات العامة التي توصلت إليها من خلال المقارنة بين المواقف السياسية المختلفة لجميع الأطراف المتعلقة بهذين الموضوعين أبدأ أولا بالملاحظات العامة فيما يخص الملاحظات العامة المتعلقة بكيف تعاملت الأطراف المختلفة مع هاتين القضيتين الملاحظة الأولى لقد ظهر لنا بالملموس أن عملية الاستقطاب في مصر كانت أكثر حدة وأوسع نطاقة حيث مست مجالات متعددة وانخرط فيها الفاعلون السياسيون الدينيون والسياسيون والمثقفون وغيرهم كما أنها تميزت بعناد الأطراف المختلفة وتمسكها برأيها ورفضها تقديم أي تنازلات معقولة من أجل تخفيف حدة توترات الاستقطابية أما في التجربة التونسية فإن الأمر كان أقل حدة حيث لعبت الطبقة السياسية الواعية دورا مهما في العبور بالبلد إلى بر الأمان حيث كانت تستشعر أهمية اللحظة التاريخية ومسؤولية إنجاحها والخوف من إفشالها ثانيا شكلت الهوية الوطنية الموضوع الأساس للاستقطاب بين الفريقين وكان مرجع ذلك الاختلاف في الرؤية والمرجعية والتي توجه بالضرورة الاختيارات الكبرى بخصوص الأدوات الدستورية والقانونية والموقف من الحريات والمرأة والمواطنة وغيرها من القضايا الشائكة لكن هذا الاختلاف في عمومه يقول إلى التركيز في نقطة خلاف جوهرية هي مسألة علاقة الدين بالدولة ودور الإسلام في السياسات العمومية والقضايا المجتمعية والخلاف بين العلمانيين والإسلاميين بخصوص هذه المسألة ليس جديدا لكن المشكلة تكمن في حفاظ كلا الطرفين على أطر مرجعية تقليدية في النظر إلى المسألة 
فالاسلاميون في عمومهم ما زالوا غير قادرين على النفوذ الى اجتهادات جريئه يتخلصون بها من المنظور السلفي المحافظ لمساله علاقه الدين بالحياه العامه ومنها اصرار كبرى كبرى حركاتهم على الربط بين الدعوي والسياسي والعمل على اسلامه المنتجات الحداثيه اما العلمانيون فان اغلب نخبهم ما زالت تعتمد الرؤيه الغربيه في عمومها وتفاصيلها للمساله وغير قادره على تقديم اجتهاد يراعي الخصوصيات الثقافيه والدينيه للوطن العربي والاسلامي الذي ما زال الدين يلعب فيه دورا اساسيا في تحديد الاطر الاجتماعيه وتشكيل وجدان الناس وتطلعاتهم الملاحظة الثالثة هذا يجرنا إلى ملاحظة مفادها أن الخلاف بين الكتلتين الإسلامية والعلمانية في التجربتين معا حول قضايا الحريات الشخصية وتطبيق الشريعة تركز في نهاية المطاف حول كيفية إقرار هذه القضايا في الوثيقة الدستورية الملاحظة الرابعة وجود كتلتين كبيرتين الإسلامية والعلمانية في مسألة الاستقطاب يخفي اختلاف الاختلافات الكثيرة بين مكوناتها في شأن التفاصيل المتعلقة بقضايا الاستقطاب فثم دائما أطراف متشددة وأخرى معتدلة في الطرفين حيث يجنح دائما المعتدلون إلى إقرار التوافقات الممكنة بينما يسعى المتشددون إلى تأجيج الأوضاع وخلق الاستقطابات الحادة داخل المجتمع والفاصل بين التجربتين في هذه المسألة هو قضية التحالفات السياسية التي يمكن أن نرجع إليها الملاحظة الخامسة لقد كان المجتمع المدني في الحالة المصرية جزء من المشكلة بحيث انخرط العديد من المؤسسات الأهلية بقوة في الصراع الدائر بين طرفي الاستقطاب أما المجتمع المدني في الحالة التونسية فقد كان جزءا من الحل بحيث لعبت أطراف هذا المجتمع دورا حاسما في التفاهمات التاريخية بين الكتلتين المتصارعتين ممثلا في الرباع الذي قاد عملية الحوار الوطني الشامل في أحلك مراحل الصراع بين الطرفين بعد استعراض هذه الملاحظات العامة يمكننا أن نستشف بيسر أننا أمام حالتين مختلفتين من الانتقال الديمقراطي ومن هنا يبرز السؤال الأهم وهو ما هي الأسباب الرئيسية التي ولدت الفروق المختلفة بين التجربتين وأدت إلى هذه المآلات المختلفة مستندنا الرئيس في تفسير الفروق الفاصلة بين التجربتين من خلال المكونين الأساسيين في عملية الاستقطاب الهوياتي هو أنموذج العقيدة السياسية الذي على أساسه تم بناء القرارات السياسية واتخاذ المواقف التدبيرية المختلفة يمكن تعريف العقيدة السياسية بأنها مجموعة الأفكار والقيم دينية كانت أو فلسفية التي تحدد الموقف من الواقع السياسي وتحكم له أو عليه وتقدم تصورا عاما للنظام السياسي الذي يجب أن يحكم الدولة وطريقة سياسة سياسته للمجتمع وعلاقة السلطة بالأفراد وحقوقهم وسياسة وحرياتهم سبب اختيارنا لهذا الانموذج التفسيري يتمثل في قدرته على تحليل المواقف السياسيه وصبر اغوارها وكشف خفاياها في الوقت الذي قد تبدو فيه الكثير من هذه المواقف غير مفهومه. لكن مراعاه لحاله الاختلاف الكائنه بين مكونات التيار الواحد في عمليه الاستقطاب فاننا ميزنا بين نوعين من من العقيده السياسيه. عقيده سياسيه جامده تتميز بثلاث سمات الانغلاق التبات أحدية التفسير عقيدة سياسية مرنة سمتها ثلاث أيضا الانفتاح والتجديد وإمكانية التأويل المستمر بس ممكن إعادة الخصائص الخصائص نعم إذا العقيدة السياسية العقيدة السياسية الجامدة تتميز بثلاث سمات سمات الانغلاق الثبات أحدية التفسير عقيدة سياسية مرنة سمتها أيضا ثلاث الانفتاح التجديد إمكانية التأويل المستمرة الوقت طيب اعتمادا على هذا الأنموذج التفسيري واستعادة المقارنات بين التجربتين يمكننا أن نلحظ بوضوح تجلي واضح للهويات المتعارضة في التجربة المصرية وبأن التجربة المصرية حكمت تجربتها بالضرورة العقيدة السياسية الجامدة هناك مؤشرات كثيرة يعني تدل على أن ما حكم يعني الفاعلين السياسيين في التجربة المصرية هي العقيدة السياسية الجامدة مثلا التحالفات السياسية رفض التنازل رفض الحوار صعود وتيرة استخدام الدين في السياسة خصوصا ما سمي بالفتاوى السياسية إلى غير ذلك أما في التجربة السياسية التونسية فقد حكمتها بالدرجة الأولى العقيدة السياسية المرنة وأيضا هناك مؤشرات يعني كثيرة تدل على ذلك آه 
اولا هناك يعني باختصار شديد فقط العناوين الايمان باهميه الحوار والتوافق ويمكن استخراجه من خلال البيانات والمواقف ثانيا المراجعه الفكريه العميقه التي قامت بها الحركه الاسلاميه التونسيه ويمكن اعطاء بعض الامثله في النقاش ان كان لي ان اختم هذا الموضوع ب يعني ملاحظات عامه او توصيات عامه فيمكن ان ادرجها في اربعه باختصار شديد اولا ضروره الوعي باهميه المرحله الانتقاليه في التحول الديمقراطي وانه يجوز فيها ما لا يجوز في غيرها ثانيا العمل على رفع كافه المخاوف المحيطه بسيطره جهه مع الاجهزه الدوله وصياغه مقومتها على اسس مذهبيه ثالثا ارجاء الخلافات المتعلقه بالهويه الى ما بعد المرحله الانتقاليه وبناء الدوله الوطنيه المتوافق على اسسها العامه رابعا واخيرا ضروره تحقيق الوحده الوطنيه والحفاظ على لحمه الجماعه الوطنيه القائده للتغيير من الانقسام وجهودها من التشتت في المرحله الانتقاليه وشكرا شكرا لا عمل جبار now we turn is this working yeah now we turn to Wendy Perlman um, who will be talking about revolution and rebirth in Syria as well uh, Wendy is an associate professor of political science at Northwestern University Illinois and her research focuses on questions of social movements emotions and political conflict in the Middle East so it's the other spectrum of what Linda was uh, discussing and she's published two books on the Palestinian national movement uh, as well as articles on Lebanese immigration uh, amongst others and right now she is actually this is i think part of a book on the syrian revolt go wendy great um Many conventional definitions equate revolution with a people's replacement of one political or economic system with another. According to these understandings, in most Arab countries that saw uprisings five years ago, those popular groundswells were failed revolutions or not revolutions at all. After all, few dismantled security states, institutionalized democracy, or fully removed old stratas of elites. However, there is more to political systems than institutions and elites. Analyses that focus only on those elements privilege matters of state at the expense of the society component of state-society relations. I argue that this misses the revolutionary essence of mass mobilization that began in 2011. In focusing on structures and policies, it underestimates the significance of the psychological, cultural, and emotional pillars that also contribute to upholding and cementing relations of domination. So in that sense, the folk, one of the focuses of this conference being at the Hawla Demokrati, I'm focusing more on at the Hawla a nefsi, a psychology, a shaksi um, that the Arab revolutions produced. I explore this dimension of revolution in the Syrian case, based on interviews that I've been conducting or have conducted to date with about 200 Syrians in Jordan in 2012 and 2013, and in Turkey in 2013, 2015, and up until just a few days ago. Um, this research, as Maha noted, is part of a larger project, a larger book project um, that I'm writing that presents displaced Syrian stories of their personal experiences of authoritarianism, protest, and war. And I plan to continue this work gathering oral histories of the Syrian revolution for the next few weeks here in Lebanon. So as an aside, if anyone here is Syrian or knows of Syrians who might be willing to sit with me and tell me their stories, I'd be tremendously grateful for the chance to meet. So I hope this project will complement a lot of other work that people are working on in various different genres of production, all of which tries to record new histories of Syria's past and Syria's present as narrated and understood by Syrians themselves. Though my interviewees varied by age, class, region, the overwhelming majority of the people with whom I spoke supported or participated in the rebellion against the Assad regime and also eventually fled Syria. So I focus only on this one slice of the multifaceted Syrian population, recognizing it's much more complicated. As a source of data, oral testimonies are fraught with methodological problems. They can contain omissions, misrepresentations, testimonies can harden into social scripts. Still, there's no better way to understand the lived experience of rebellion than to ask those who've lived it. 
Sharing a sample of those testimonies today, I'd like to present an interpretation of the Syrian revolt as a kind of rebirth for those who identified with that revol revolution. For decades, the regimes of Hafez and then Bashar al-Assad treated citizens with a combination of intimidation and contempt. That most citizens acquiesced was in part due to feelings of fear and also futility, as well as the forms of behavior that those sentiments encouraged. Though some dared to push the bounds of political permissibility, most complied with the system most of the time, if not come to believe that no other way was feasible. Syrians' launching of mass protests was revolutionary because it marked people's refusal to fulfill that role that the system demanded and required of them. This was a revolution, regardless of whether the revolt ultimately dislodges the Assad regime. Even if authoritarianism survives or new forms of oppression emerge, the state-society relations that existed in the past are unlikely to be reimposed exactly as they were. This interpretation resonates with the expression heard throughout the Arab world in 2011 when people explained how they came to participate in protest in Qasr Hajis al Khauf, the barrier of fear broke. In Syria, surmounting the fear barrier was the first step in individuals demanding political rights, accountability, and participation. Yet the meaning of the struggle also went beyond politics. Again and again, my interviewees described their surmounting of fear as an act that transformed them as human beings. It challenged not only their relationship to the state, but also their relationship to their fellow citizens, to society, to their understanding of the nation, and even to their own sense of self. In my interviews, the perspective that this perspective of transformation was most apparent when people described participation in their first demonstration. Let me share a small sample with you. For example, one thirty-something from Holmes said to me, it was the first time in my life that I felt like I could speak. A young mother from Holmes also concurred, it was like talking from your heart in spite of everything. A student from rural Idlib said, it was the first time I ever said no. Another man said his first demonstration was better than his wedding day, and he laughed. When I said that in front of my wife, she refused to talk to me for a month. <laughs> a young law graduate from Aleppo said, as a Muslim, I felt like I was going on Hajj. You felt like you did something that no one before you could do. A computer science student from Hema said, I got goosebumps. I was doing something new. I tried something that I couldn't imagine possible. I could die in a year or two. I don't think I will ever feel happier than I was during the demonstration. I don't think anyone outside Syria has ever felt that way before. So helping me to interpret these, a psychologist originally from the Damascus suburbs analyzed some of these experiences from other testimonies he'd heard. Um, and this is his words from his scientific perspective. He said, some people told me that their first experience of feeling freedom was like a dream. The sensation spread fast among the people. The feeling of standing up and freely saying anything you want is new and amazing. It was contagious. People became ready to sacrifice everything to protect that wonderful feeling. Now there is a new culture of freedom. It is not complete yet. But the main thing in this culture is the efficacy of the individual, the sense that I can participate in helping my society. The authoritarian state says to its citizen, I can give you life and food, and I can deprive you of life and food. Don't think. Now the citizen asks, why can't I think? I should think. The person who lives for a long time in an atmosphere of repression does not notice that he is living without hope. But now, even if someone is comfortable financially, he will not enjoy his life if he is not free, if he does not feel his humanity. It's like when someone travels to a, live in a new place and realizes that he wasn't happy before. Now he's going to continue to look for that happiness. 
So this speaker mentioned what he called a new culture of freedom. One immediate effect of this culture was a surge in political expression. Here a young writer from the Damascus suburbs explains that what Syrians once thought was impossible, exercising voice, has turned on its head, such that it is now surrender of voice that many come to view as impossible. He told me, we used to talk about politics, but only late at night when we were hanging out together. We never talked in public spaces. Talking when you're outside, just like that, impossible. People would say, as I'm sure you've all heard, the walls have ears. Be careful. They'll take you away. No one will ever see you again. He says, after six months of revolution, it was all over. You walk into a cafe, and people are talking about politics. You walk in the street, people are talking about politics. Chalas, it's impossible that we'll ever go back to being afraid of this regime. All of these reflections converge in detailing a humanistic interpretation of the meaning of revolution. In participating in protest, individuals felt that they were ceasing to be the silenced people performing the role that the authoritarian system expected of them, and were instead emerging into the kind of free people whose liberation rendered that system untenable. In this sense, their words communicate ideas and emotions that conjure a notion of rebirth. Let me quote for you what one a writer from Sueda told me, invoking this metaphor of rebirth explicitly. She said, I believe the regime would fall from the first minute we protested in the streets and repeated freedom. When Syrians went into the street to demonstrate, they lived this experience. They defeated the regime. The regime died and was broken. Now we are living the details. I know it's taking a long time. She said these words in 2012. And maybe we will stay longer in this situation. But Syria after March 15th is different than Syria before. We will not be silent again. We will not allow anyone to steal our dreams and our voices again. <laughs> this revolution gave us a chance to be reborn. You can't choose the way you were born, and you can't remember anything about it. We were living this closed life, and then we saw our real birth. This time we made a choice. We took the first breath and we shouted our first shout, just like a newborn baby shouts. Transforming from submission to freedom creates a new person. Now when we say we are Syrian, we feel very proud of ourselves because we realized we're alive. It's a new birth. في البداية حددت أن المتغير الذي خصصت الورقة للحديث عنه هو مجرد واحد من العوامل الأساسية في فشل الانتقال الديمقراطي في مصر وليس هو يعني مجموع العوامل التي أثرت في يعني تيسير عملية الانتقال الديمقراطي في مصر أو في تونس عفوا أو تعسير في مصر وبالتالي هناك عوامل كثيرة ومتعددة التي يمكن أن نتحدث عنها وشكلت فارقا أساسيا بين التجربتين مثلا الدور دي المجتمع المدني وقد أشرت إليه فالمجتمع المدني يعني لعب دورا أساسيا في التجربة الديمقراطية أو في الانتقال الديمقراطي في تونس ونحن نعلم أن الحوار الذي قاده الرباعي المشكل أساسا المجتمع أهلي مدني كان له دور أساسي في حسم يعني عملية التقارب في عملية الاستقطاب بين الفرقاء السياسيين ربما هناك عوامل أخرى هناك عامل جيش الجيش يعني في مصر ليس هو الجيش في تونس هناك أيضا طبقة متوسطة صلبة ومتينة ويعني متنورة هناك أيضا تقاليد حوارية عريقة التي ميزت المجتمع التونسي هناك حساسية مفرطة ضد العنف هناك يعني عوامل كثيرة جدا أنا يعني خصصت مسألة سجل الهوية لأن في الحقيقة أثارتني كثيرا بتتبع مجريات الثورة المصرية يعني كانت ربما كلنا تابعنا ذلك كان الاستقطاب على شده وكلنا كنا نتمنى أن يحصل نوع من الانفراج بين الفرقاء المختلفين للوصول إلى توافقات ممكنة لمحاولة الوصول إلى تيسير انتقال الديمقراطي في مصر لأننا نعلم جميعا بأن نجاح الانتقال الديمقراطي في مصر كان سيكون له انعكاسا كبيرا على الوطن العربي ككل 
فلهذا خصصت يعني هذا المتغير وتحدثت عنه وحاولت ان اقارن يعني بين التجربتين حيث لاحظت من خلال مؤشرات متعدده بان الافتراق الثنائي والاستقطاب الثنائي في في مصر كان اشد منه في تونس هذا يعني من بين عوامل اخرى يسر الانتقال الديمقراطي وعسره في التجربه المصريه بطبيعه الحال لماذا الاستقطاب الهويتي وليس الاستقطاب السياسي لان الاستقطاب السياسي ممكن لو استطعنا ان نحافظ على الاستقطاب في المستوى السياسي هذا عادي جدا ويعني مشروع ان ان يكون هناك نوع من التنافس السياسي بين الفرقاء المختلفين وربما تكون لهم ايضا مرجعيات مختلفه ولا باس في ذلك لكن ان يتم تركيز هذا الاختلاف في القضايا الهوياتية التي تؤدي إلى تشظي ليس فقط الفرقاء السياسيين ولكن أيضا المجتمع لرمة وهذا ما لاحظناه في النهاية في التجربة المصرية بحيث أنه تم التمييز ليس بين فريقين سياسيين بل بين شعبين شعب يعني ربما يناصر قضية معينة وشعب يناصر قضية أخرى وهذه مسألة خطيرة قد تؤدي إلى تفتت المجتمع ثم أنا حاولت أن أفسر هذا الاستقطاب انطلاقا من أنموذج معين هو العقيدة السياسية لأن العقيدة السياسية أعتقد هي التي كانت العامل الرئيس في دفع الفرقاء السياسيين إلى اتخاذ المواقف المختلفة سواء كانت سياسية أو مجتمعية أو حتى دينية ولاحظت بأن هذه العقيدة السياسية ليست يعني على شاكلة واحدة ولكن ميزت بين شكلين من العقيدة السياسية عقيدة سياسية جامدة ليست لها القدرة على يعني إبداع اجتهادات جديدة وخلق تواصلات ممكنة مع الطرف الآخر وعقيدة سياسية مرنة كان بإمكانها أو بالفعل أمكانها ذلك في التجربة التونسية أن تخلق الجسور التي يعني خفت فيها هذا الاستقطاب المبني على أسس هويتية وكان من بين العوامل المسهلة للانتقال والتحول الديمقراطي في في تونس. فلذا أعتقد أن التجربة التونسية طبعا التجربة التونسية لم تمر يعني إلى مرحلة البناء الديمقراطي التام ولكن بما أن تتوفر على هذه العقيدة السياسية المرنة في سواء لدى الإسلاميين أو لدى غير الإسلاميين فأنا أعتقد أنها بإمكانها أن تحملهم على الوصول إلى بناء دولة وطنية متوافق عليها على أسس وطنية متوافق عليها على أسس للتنافس السياسي وهو قلت مشروع ممكن وأظن أن تونس إذا استمرت على نفس المنوال يمكن أن تصل إلى ذلك شكرا شكرا Wendy. Thank you for these terrific um, questions and many provocative challenges. It gives me a lot to think about. So I'll, um, I guess, go in reverse order from the questions that were asked. So this, the last question about um, both oppression and the continuation of fear are terrific um, points. I think that the sense of despair suggests maybe if despair would abort this surmounting of fear. Um, I think it might be interesting to think about how um, maybe one emotion doesn't necessarily cancel the other one, but instead there's this accumulation and intertwining of all these very different mixed, totally contradictory emotions that must be in the Syrian experience now. I've absolutely heard that the same degree despair, depression, and what re really interested me in my last interviews in, in Turkey just a few weeks ago was also guilt, the survivor's guilt of how am I still alive when so many people aren't? So I think that there's a tremendously intense mixture of really, really terrible feelings still mixed with memories of what for some people was an almost unspeakable, indescribable kind of joy. All of it will be constructing whatever is this new Syrian citizen and um, it's all part of the complications of it. But I don't want to um, dismiss the degree of despair. And it's interesting when you said this anecdote of somebody saying if they were forgetting to laugh. The last quotation I read by this woman from Sweden who was talking about, we'll never let people, dis the regime, steal our voices again. She said to me almost the exact same thing, that she had gone to a doctor who said, now just relax. And she said, I realized I'd forgotten how to relax. What does that even, even mean? So that was her experience. At the same time she was swearing, it was a rebirth. I was like a newborn shouting for the first time. And they're both real and they're both happening um, at the same time. 
As far as not um, sort of underestimating the degree of fear, I mean, absolutely, I've given talks um, to a Syrian American group in Chicago and had people come to me from the audience, Syrian, saying, I was afraid to come to this meeting in the suburbs of, of Chicago. And I think that's one absolutely to agree that not everyone has overcome this fear and or overcome it in every to every degree. But in some ways I think it encourages us to appreciate to an even greater degree what it meant to go out in a demonstration on the streets in Syria. If that kind of fear is so ingrained in people's sense of self that even far, far away from the borders of Syria, it's still a part of people's very sense of self. It's a tremendously, we need to look all the more closely at the intensity and the depth of the process of overcoming it perhaps gradually or, or um, in ways that can go back and go back and forth. And I guess I would say lastly about this issue of fear is I think it's interesting to think about different types of fear. People might use the word fear, ex the same word, experience fear in different things, but there, there, there gotta be different types of fear and whatever the fear that people might be experiencing at this stage, is it the same fear when back in the days of the walls have ears or is it a different type of fear and what are that's implications for people as, as individuals and for political possibilities. I guess that's just sort of a, a question. Um, I should go a lot quick, quicker if I'm going <laughs> to answer this. The, the idea of writing narratives of, of hope and how to reconcile this with it without ignoring the dire conditions that agree, uh, that, that, that um, exist today. I would uh, agree in saying almost they're two sides of the same coin. By looking back at that moment of such an almost unspeakable hope makes the direness of the current conditions all the more tragic. Not just tragic from a humanitarian point of view of lives destroyed and a country destroyed and, and all of the figures we know to add up the, the depth of the tragedy, but it's also in these kinds of testimonies of people saying it was the first moment I felt like a human being and then that has also been taken away, not just life and livelihood. So. Um, Appreciating the hope can also let us see the tragedy in all of its sort of intensity and colors. Um, about the issue of, of exile and, and, disposi and dispossession, I, yeah, absolutely, this is a huge part. And it wasn't what I focused on today because the, the theme of the conference on, on revolutions, but I would just say two things about sort of ideas I've, I heard um, about this idea of exile and dispossession and, and um, the, being a, a refugee. One is that the s stories and reflections that people told me changed over time from when I first did interviews in 2012 to 2013 to 2015. That experience of, in, in the beginning, there's many, at least from when I was picking up with Syrians, very much a sense of temporariness. Oh, we're here in Jordan, but our bags are packed. We're going to go back to Syria any day now. By 2013, that was beginning to change. And I heard the first sort of glimpses of people saying things like, I heard the French embassy might be giving out us, beginning to talk about going to Europe. And I, what I just heard these last interviews I was doing in, in Turkey was this more of a sense of, all of my friends are in Germany and Sweden, and I'm the only one left here. And do I stay? I have a commitment to staying in Gaziantep where I can see the Syrian border and I can go back and I still feel close. But how much longer do I hold out before I also say enough and, and get, try to find try to go with my family and almost in the sense of is that giving up on some dream of still going back? Also heard things like uh, People who um, maybe were in Turkey and registered their children in, in Arabic-speaking schools in 2012 or 2013 because they're like, we're just going to go back to Syria and I want my seven-year-old to have an education in Arabic, now beginning to say, did I lose an opportunity? My kid should be learning Turkish. Um, so there's that, that sort of, the one it was, that sort of change over time. The overwhelming sense I got thinking about people, or pe people talking about reflecting on the experience of being a refugee was a sense of total instability. I mean, adam la istiqrar. But both materially, how do we find enough to make ends meet? Our savings are running out. The sheer material desperation of surviving without money, and work, and so forth. But also the sort of existential psychological instability of where am I going? How long will I be here? Can I plan for the future? Because I don't know where I'm going to be and how long I'll be here. And the sense of just total rootlessness. Um, um, that affects all aspects of life, personal relationships, marriages, familiar relationships, um, to planning for the future, to people continuing their studies and so forth. I think it's really um, instability in, in a deep sense. Okay, I'm going. Um, briefly on, on, on Rami's question about um, the sense of the, the, the future, the people I talked to didn't, didn't really get into details of that sort. It was more 
collapse the regime, if we can collapse the regime, and badain all the tafasil and what kind of constitution. People weren't even beginning to think about that sense. They couldn't almost imagine that far. And lastly, uh, um, Fawaz's question is in many ways the most, most difficult one. And in the, in the end of the day, if we're in front of a counter-revolution or a civil war, and either the regime stays or a regime is able to renew itself, is that the question? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in the end of the day, kind of almost so, so what? And in some ways, I'm just proposing the question of even if a regime looks the same, maybe even the same people, the same rules, the same policies, the same institutions, if we look into, you know, can peer into the mind and the heart of that individual citizen, is it possible that they've been somehow changed by the experience of even witnessing or participating in protest such that there's something different in the citizen such, such that if even if the, all the structures are the same or have been renewed and are just as authoritarian as they were before or even worse, is it really the same political system or is there something, something different even if it's just the memory of and the knowledge that mass challenge is possible whereas before it was just not even thinkable. So in some ways I'm just proposing the question of if we look at that level of the citizens, c can we maybe see the situation through a different lens? Um, and I think it's possible to answer the question of no. In the end of the day, who has power? What do they do with it? So what? But, um, but it, it's proposing the question to think about. Actually, if I can just add to that, uh, I think we're seeing very similar experiences in people who participated in uh, uprisings across the region. Mm -hmm. You talk to people in Tunis, you talk to people in, uh, in Egypt, um, the sense of empowerment that as individuals they are able to make a difference or they can make a difference is not one that can be taken away. And I do think, I mean, I do agree with you that no matter what political system is in place, uh, the relationship between that political system and individual citizens cannot be de facto, cannot go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I think, think we're seeing the, the impact of that change to a certain extent in both Tunisia and Egypt perhaps, where you know we have a different model that is developing. But I won't go into that. I'm going to open up for a few more questions. Okay, okay. Well, very quickly. And then there is a difference between breaking fear in a demonstration, which is the peaceful part, and the emotions that are built in a civil war where people are killing each other. That's the point. It's, I, I, didn't, I didn't point to the fact that the regime okay. is going to be renewed. No regime is renewed. It's renewed in very bizarre ways. But <laughs> it's interesting to study what civil wars do. To people. people. Yeah. Thank you, Fawaz. Fawad has a question. We're going to take three more questions and give the panelists a chance at an answer. No, hold on, hold on. Fawad, is, uh, there's somebody behind you first. I have heard from people that follow Syria closely that um, uh, there has been so much displacement, so much loss of um, human economic capability that uh, you could hardly put together in a post, uh, you know, a settlement situation an economy anywhere near the level of what Syria was once, say, before all of this happened. And I was wondering uh, if you could say a bit more or if you'd be willing to forecast what you think the size of the Syrian economy would be in the event of a settlement, assuming, I mean, there are different kinds of settlement, but assuming, say, a settlement that leaves Syria more or less intact as a, as a geographical legal entity as we understand it. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if, if it's exaggerated to say that uh, there's been so much of a drain of economic, you know, brain talent, uh, skilled manpower, and so forth and so on, uh, and such a disruption of the order that maybe Syria shrinks to the economy of a very poor sub-Saharan African state. Related to that, maybe Wendy knows uh, from her interviews, uh, she, she's alluded to this a bit, as to uh, how many of these uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees are, are thinking they're, they'll come back. Thank you. 
I have a question in the back on the side and a question here. I think we'll call it a day. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all and thank you Wendy very much for your presentation. Of course, I appreciate it very much being on similar lines. <laughs> um, but my question is also like the Syrian case, I think it's a very tough case you chose mm -hmm. um, to make this point and to say that maybe some moments um, of what they have experienced might have moved on with them and might have continued. So really my question would be maybe the people that you meet uh, or you have met in um, who, who left Syria already and like kind of are in this strange transition. Um, maybe you can ask them also, or maybe you have already asked them, how how does, like, if anything has left them, like, did they, like, with these experiences, commit to anything that they feel is so important to them that will not change, where they feel like kind of, I don't know, uh, my relations with my wife, my relations with, um, uh, that I will state uh, if something is wrong, uh, even if I'm a migrant or so on. Maybe there was an effect and maybe not. And my question would be if you maybe have looked into it, because maybe it can show you or give you better cases of whether or not this moment um, or the, or or this phase where they felt these particular emotions has really a long-term effect or maybe it was just for a while and they're gone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you again. We have one last question here, please. Uh, Simon Saloum, again, master's student, Middle Eastern Studies, Mediterranean Studies at the University of Balamand. Uh, my question to uh, Dr. Windy. Uh, yes, maybe we agree that to some extent, I'll to a great extent, that yes, the relationship between the Assad regime and the, and the Syrian people is not going to be reversed as it was before uh, 15 March 2011. But the question is, what if a new power emerges in Syria? Is it going to include all Syrian groups, for example? Are we sure that they are going to include, for example, the Kurds? Are they going to implement uh, a true citizenship? So are we sure that they are not going to use op op oppression again, or, or do Syrians will, um, will uh, we're not sure that Syrians are going to lose their f sense of fear, maybe not by the Assad regime, but by the new force. So in this sense, the oppression and fear is not reversed. They're still under fear and oppression. So how should we do in this case? How should we behave? What is the duty of the new force coming to Syria? Thank you. Um, each of the speakers will have five minutes to respond. Uh, actually, a little less, four. We do it evenly. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, um, first and sort of the biggest bang for the buck, I, I absolutely agree. So, thank you. You, you, you. you stated that extremely well, and I try to deal with it in other parts of this project because fear is not coming from nowhere. It's not like people are just afraid. It's a reaction to regime policies and regime structures. And I think it's interesting this sort of cycle of regime, there's certain structures and policies that create fear and fear creates a certain way of acting which can then renew and support the continuation of the regime and it's all it's all parts. But I think that sort of a state structured focus of, of research, a regime focus might say there are this, this many security forces and this much of the budget to internal intelligence and this kind of network of informants and there's now this very rich opportunity to ask Syrian citizens Citizens. So what was that like to live with this? And this sort of sense of, of fear, of futility, of distrust of others and the sort of way that this a security state can kind of so that uh, distrust in society and affect social relations, I think in all aspects is um, absolutely. What what does it mean to live authoritarianism? Um, I think is a great chance to kind of complement the research we have about authoritarian survival strategies and so forth. So I absolutely agree. Um, uh, Professor Hudson's question about um, sort of how many people think about going back. I mean, I d this isn't a, a scientific sample, so I can't really say. I would just say, from my observations, fewer and fewer over time. And I could just, in my own anecdotal way, see the changes from 2012 to 2015. And, and I, you can see this, especially as people think about the welfare of their children going on to more stable places where there, there can be a future for their children. I also thought it was interesting to see in the lives of sort of this whole set, sort of strata of young 20-something activists who when I first met them in 2012, these were the guys who, you know, their whole lives were on hold living and breathing revolution 24 hours a day. When I met them in 2012, that was still very much the case. By 2013, some of these guys were beginning to say things like, 
do I have a right to also live as a person? I put my to drop my studies and halfway through when I maybe would like to get married and think about my. There's almost a sense of guilt about pe pe people thinking about their, themselves as people, as opposed to just activists. But beginning to feel like, what about me as a human being that's been put on pause? By 2015, segment the same sort of handful of guys I met. M many of them are now married and beginning to have children. And their, their thinking has very much changed now that there's a baby on the way or there's a baby. Now it's like, how can I get to Germany to get a passport for my child as opposed to, you know, I can't look for a second away from Facebook to see what's happening. So it's, and if this, that's a little, a little window into sort of the larger collective, that's one thing of every day that goes by, or every year that goes by, the, the percentage of people thinking going back might, might decline. We feel about sort of the effect of this breaking of fear on, on all sorts of personal relations. I'd love to talk to you about it more, but I think it's been interesting to maybe think about marriages. I've heard some sort of, I mean, again, it's sort of anecdotal, but, but sometimes uh, almost the thawra in the sense of women who are like, I never really wanted to live with this man, and I'm not going to anymore. There's a thawra <laughs> shakhsiyo. So that, that might be interesting to explore. Liberation. Yes, yeah, so of liberation in all sense. Um, uh, the last question, what if a new sort of power might emerge or new groups that are just as oppressive? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the, the future is totally unknown. It's, and I wouldn't want to make predictions or guesses about where this is headed, what will be a final outcome, when. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I would just keep the question alive of how, has, how does fear change, what, what's changed, what hasn't changed, um, what's reversible, what's not. Um, I th we just want people to consider to, to keep, keep asking the questions, but um, I won't make any predictions about where any of this is going otherwise. Thank you, Andy. Michael, just a quick response also. The, um, the exodus we saw to Europe this summer is a symptom of this loss of hope and the sense yes. that there's no future left in Syria for many. So the idea that these people have now made it there will come back, I think, is unfortunately, uh, and a lot of the those who left is, are the professional uh, working, you know, the professional class. Uh, Syria has lost something like 80% of its medical uh, professionals. Um, longevity is 20% less. We're talking about 4 million people outside the country and another almost 7.6 million displaced within the country. So the devastation at that level is, is uh, quite considerable. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for your patience and for staying with us until now. And thank you to the speakers of ISTI, to Linda, Hafez, and Wendy for a very, very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.